Dr. Leibovitz was the first knowledge management officer at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center. He was ranked one of the top 10 knowledge management researchers and practitioners out of 11,000 worldwide and was ranked number two in knowledge management strategy worldwide, according to the January 2010 Journal of Knowledge Management. He's in the top 2% of the top scientists in the world, according to a 2019 Stanford study. Dr. Leibowitz has published over 45 books and counting, and a myriad of journal articles on knowledge management, analytics, financial literacy, intelligence systems, and IT management. He has been a Fulbright Scholar at Queen's University and at Delarna University in Sweden, and has lectured and consulted worldwide. Based on Dr. Leibowitz's recent book, Pivoting Government Through Digital Transformation, this evening's talk will feature how the federal government can best infuse data analytics into the workforce and how to further develop the digital talent pipeline in the federal government. Even though the US government may not have reached the human capital crisis as predicted over the years, there are still many gaps in various job classifications across the US government. The talk will highlight some of the key issues and approaches to understanding these challenges by pivoting government through digital transformation. Before I hand it over to Jay, just a few housekeeping items. This presentation is being recorded. After the presentation, there will be a Q&A session. For the in-person audience, please wait for somebody to bring the mic to you. That way we, we can hear you in the auditor, both in the auditorium and the remote audience can also hear you. For the remote audience, please keep your mics muted. We welcome your input and questions. Please drop them in chat and we will make sure we address as many of them as possible. With that said, let's give Jay a warm Seton Hall welcome. All yours, Jay. <laughs> Thanks, Renu. Appreciate that. Oh. <laughs> well, um, <clears throat> thank you, uh, Renu, for that kind introduction. As I said, my mother would have been proud, so uh, uh, you're, you're too kind. And thank you for everyone for your patience. Um, and for those online, uh, technology is great when it works, so uh, we were able to work through all the, all the different issues. So it's, it's really a pleasure to be back here on campus um, and to see uh, some wonderful friends and smiling faces as well as uh, meeting some new friends. Uh, it's also perfect evening for uh, so many activities. I know there was the graduate student uh, reception and uh, the tree lighting and all the festivities and we had a beautiful uh, 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 dinner. So thank you so much for your hospitality. So uh, during this past year, um, I served in a um, kind of an unusual role. Um, it was called the Executive in Residence for Public Service. And this was at Columbia. You developed the digital talent pipeline uh, in, the, in the federal government, particularly in, in the data analytics area. So um, there are many things that we can discuss when we talk about how do we pivot government through digital transformation, but I'm going to really focus on uh, the latter part of my role on how we can best expand um, the what, what's called the digital talent in the federal government. So this might be more uh, appropriate for the students in the audience and those who are looking you know for opportunities to work in the analytics space with with the government but i hope to provide some value-added benefits and to let you know the reason why this is so important there's there was a recent study and it showed that just seven percent of the federal civilian workers in, in the federal government um, are under the the age of 30. And this compares to about 20% of the broader labor market. 
At the same time, about a third of the US federal civilians are eligible to retire by 2025. So there's tremendous need for you all to hopefully help our country and, and fill some of these gaps. So um, I'll take you through um, uh, some ideas and uh, some initiatives and some programs that you might be interested in. And I think um, it might provide some additional insight for you all. Well, I had the pleasure of um, being here, I think it was around May 9th, uh, Seton Hall hosted the New Jersey Big Data Alliance Conference, and <clears throat> I was able to get a few photo shots, uh, President Passerini before she became the interim president, and uh, Dean Strausser uh, and Mark Rin, who has been, uh, he's the chief uh, technical officer for data at Pfizer, and he's been teaching our capstone course in the data analytics program. So um, it was a wonderful opportunity to uh, to see everyone, and it and it's uh, it's great to be back again on you know here on the campus. Well, as people think about career paths, um, sometimes we just need a sign uh, to help guide us. So this was in Livingston, and I had to include this. I'm not sure how well it fits in with the presentation, but <laughs> it was in front of one of the homes here on the way to Seton Hall uh, back in May. So I just I just wanted a sign. So um, so anyway, uh, you know, sometimes we we do look for uh, maybe uh, some guidance on high, you know, to help guide us. Uh, I do some work looking at intuition based decision making and maybe sometimes, you know, gut feeling also has a role to play along with the data driven reasoning. Well, I'm a native Washingtonian, uh, even though we've been living in New York City uh, for, for the past two years, and I've always been interested in helping the government. Um, so even this past year, I worked on projects with the United Nations uh, Population Fund in the US Navy. And this is a photo um, at the Fulbright Canada office with some of the Fulbright Canada officials, and I, I was fortunate enough to, to spend some time uh, as, as a Fulbright Research Chair uh, in the Business School at Queen's University in Kingston. So, you know, even Canada uh, has many similar types of issues that we're facing now. Well, I know we have a few uh, faculty in the audience, so um, I just wanted to highlight a, a few of the areas that I've been interested in. One deals with how can we develop an enterprise-wide analytic strategy for an organization. So I've been doing some work uh, with, with different companies, uh, looking also at the, uh, the literature, and um, I actually was able to um, develop this conceptual framework for BI business intelligence and analytics where there are business and IT drivers, which um, then uh, hopefully uh, lead into uh, an analytic strategy with certain business intelligence enablers here. And then um, the goal is to build out an implementation roadmap with various BI success factors. Now, the bullets that are shown in red uh, are from uh, about 11 international experts. I did a Delphi survey uh, in order to get their opinion as to what were the most important uh, criteria or factors uh, in each of these areas in building out an enterprise-wide strategy. So for example, um, uh, one organization, uh, uh, Office Depot, which is headquartered in Boca Raton, Florida, not a bad place to to spend part of the, at least the winter, I was there over the summer, so <laughs> a lot of rain in the summertime. But but anyway, um, uh, they actually had about 23 analytics groups throughout different parts of the company, and they were concerned about sub-optimizing. Um, so they had a business intelligence competency center that would bring end users or business owners to work with data scientists, data analytics professionals to, you know, to solve their problems. But anyway, it would be great if some of you as students um, might even try to validate this framework. Um, so anyway, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting area that really hasn't had a lot of attention, uh, at least in the research. 
part of part of the work that um, I've been involved in uh, relating to some of the surveys, uh, we've asked a number of questions. One of them is, how would you like to see your analytics improve? And so speaking uh, with industry and government folks, these were probably the most pressing areas that they found um, to, 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 to be needed still uh, to improve their analytics uh, ecosystem in their organizations. So what's great is that your uh, analytics programs here at Seton Hall uh, really touch on many of these key areas. So visualization is always so important. Uh, I remember speaking with uh, Joe Lacuna. He was uh, the former chief analytics officer. He retired from Starbucks in Seattle. And he said, you know, Jay, I can find all of the applied mathematicians and statisticians that I need, but I need people who know the business speak and who can very quickly convey the analytics results, typically through visualization means to the C-level executives. So visualization is so important. Also, you know, how do you build and nurture an analytics culture among executives and linking to business plans and key performance indicators and the like. So there's still many, many challenges that um, are facing us, uh, not only in the government, but certainly in industry. Well, based on my work this past year, uh, I wanted to highlight some of our research and initiatives uh, that are being considered to infuse data science and analytics into the federal government. And as a reference point, um, you can take a look. Uh, this was uh, back in February um, in the ORMS Today. Informs is uh, uh, pretty much the professional society for analytics. Um, used to be operations, research management, science professionals. I know some of uh, some of the Seton Hall colleagues here are members are of Inform. So anyway, feel free to take a look as a follow up. Uh, on, on some of this writing. So as part of my gathering effort to better determine the analytics landscape in the US government, we fielded a convenience-based survey to various government agencies. So they were mostly federal, although we had a few uh, city governments uh, in DC and New York City. And these are the different um, uh, agencies that responded and it included anywhere from Social Security Administration to the Department of Commerce, the EPA, Treasury, FDIC, National Science Foundation, Customs. So a pretty, a pretty good mixture of organizations. And I'll just show you a few screenshots uh, and then kind of highlight uh, the, the full summary coming up shortly. So out of those who responded, um, we were fortunate. We had about... Um, <laughs> 42%, I have to be careful because my wife is in the audience and she teaches organization communication. So she always say, you don't have to be that exacting. So I'll say, okay, a little less than half were senior executive uh, service um, uh, uh, civilians who are typically either political appointees. Um, so they're at the highest level in the government. And we had about uh, almost half uh, of the others were, were at the executive level. So a pretty good, uh, uh, response from you know uh, senior uh, senior folks, at least at the executive level, and we asked them a number of questions. Um, uh, and this is just one to try to rate their level of agreement as it pertained to various statements. And it turned out that almost half the respondents felt neutral on whether their mid-level managers really had the skills and confidence uh, to use data to inform their decision making. And a little more than half felt that their internal data quality was suspect. Yet 80% of the respondents said they still don't rely on their intuition and experience. So um, if, if you ask many executives why they might rely more on their experiential learning, oftentimes you hear that they don't trust their internal data quality. So the single truth of the data uh, and making sure the data is well cleansed, um, you know, is so important. I'll just show you a few others and then I'll, I'll kind of give you the highlight. Uh, we asked about, um, you know, would you be interested in enhancing your education and training in data science 
through different types of either executive short courses, workshops, uh, certificate programs, uh, lecture, a webinar series, uh, or other ways. And these might give you some ideas for offerings through the your analytics programs uh, here at Seton Hall. So, um, and again, you know, it's a little biased audience, so they certainly favor, you know, executive ed short courses, but again, uh, they seem, you know, to be very open to these ideas. And then we also ask questions about what are some of the main barriers that you face uh, in applying data science in your government context. And the two main uh, constraints given were the difficulty of hiring talent uh, in this area, and then the issue of interoperability. So having various data silos um, is a big problem uh, in the government. Um, so in the interest of time, let me just show you kind of the key results. So again, uh, there was concern that their uh, mid-level managers really didn't have the necessary skill sets uh, in the data analytics area. Um, sharing data across departments remains to be an issue. Um, the respondents uh, said they rely more on their data than their intuition, but about one third of the respondents felt that their internal data quality was suspect. Uh, about 90% were aware that there is a new data scientist position in the government. So actually as of December, 2021, um, the federal government recognized that they needed a separate job classification as a data scientist. Previously, it was you would have to come in as an operations research analyst or a business analyst, and you couldn't command the higher salaries or have the necessary skill sets that you would as a data scientist. So, um, so th there are a number of key issues. Um, in terms of uh, looking at, you know, what are the skill sets that they possess? They felt very comfortable with, you know, pretty simple uh, regression and uh, some basic statistical analyses. Um, uh, and many of them actually were quite interested uh, and worked in the GIS area. And policing and public safety and transportation seem to be uh, key areas where data science techniques were being used more than others. Um, in terms of their skill sets, they feel pretty comfortable with Excel and, you know, dashboarding and uh, SQL databases. Uh, Python, um, I'm laughing because Professor Rosenthal is a Python expert and I told him I was trying to bone up on my Python and I guess uh, my absorptive capacity once, <laughs> once I I reached the 66, you know, uh, it isn't where it should be. But but anyway, um, they did cite that they, they just didn't have the knowledge base though in the AI deep learning um, uh, areas, which, which you would expect because, you know, those who responded were fairly senior. So anyway, um, I'll just show you uh, in terms of the business and soft skills, the the skills that the respondents felt most comfortable were that, that they could learn very quickly. So we as professors, the best skill that we could teach you all as students is learning how to learn. Tools, technologies, methodologies are going to change, but if you can learn how to learn, you could be very adaptive and be able to relate to uh, any environment. And that's, uh, that's something that is so important. Um, the basically those who responded felt you know pretty comfortable with their communication presentation skills and seeing the big picture. On the technical side, um, they also felt pretty comfortable in data reporting and data storytelling. Um, they weren't as comfortable as you would expect with some of the database design and management and technical skill sets. And um, with the analytics skills, they felt pretty comfortable with using a number of the analytics tools and visualization tools like Tableau or Power BI, whatnot. Uh, but again, um, they certainly didn't feel comfortable looking at things like prescriptive analytics, bringing in optimization techniques along with uh, some AI and deep learning. So 
So what we uh, try to do is based upon uh, these surveys, and then um, I actually conducted 30 interviews across Columbia University. Um, uh, and Columbia, uh, like Seton Hall, has many schools or colleges. So it was great. Um, it was so nice to, uh, to get the views from outside of, let's say, the data science or engineering computer science area. So that was very helpful. And then in addition, I conducted about 35 interviews uh, working with the Partnership for Public Service. Um, so this is the, a Washington-based nonpartisan uh, organization that's in charge of um, mainly federal executive senior leadership development. So Max Sears, the CEO, and part of the arrangement uh, with Columbia is that I would work with them in Washington um, to, uh, to try to fill this vacuum uh, in terms of providing better acumen in the government for data analytics and, and even AI. So we identified a set of initiatives to address uh, some of this analytics awareness and talent issues. Um, it's not the best slide to show you, but just very quickly, we were putting together a federal executive boot camp on what we call decision intelligence to um, uh, be geared for senior executives to better understand um, some of the key uh, issues and concepts uh, and techniques relating to analytics and, and even AI. Um, we put together a data science and US government day, um, which uh, was scheduled for April. It actually had to be postponed for a number of reasons, uh, but we had, um, the U.S. Deputy Chief Data Scientist, uh, Dr. Dominique Duval, uh, as a speaker, we had um, key people from the U.K., uh, Canada, who are involved looking at data science uh, across their government agencies, uh, various panels looking at this issue of the digital talent, so um, the, the tech talent organization in California, the Data Foundation. There are many, many groups who are looking at this area. And then from the university side, you know, we thought, well, it'd be great to involve some of the undergrads and even the graduate students in data science uh, with capstones uh, at Columbia. Uh, like at Seton Hall, their analytics is in different schools. So uh, the business school there has its own set of business analytics programs in the uh, computer science engineering programs. They, there's a master of data science um, and there are about, uh, about 500 students in that program, full-time, a two-year program. Um, so anyway, we, want, we wanted, uh, well, what's funny is everyone's interested in the dollar science. So it's often hard to convince people to work for NGOs or the government, that was an issue. But at least if we could expose the students to capstone projects working with federal agencies, right? Uh, you know, looking at social justice and and uh, you know sustainability, a lot of key issues and diversity would be so important. So there are a number of initiatives that uh, we were interested in in uh, moving forward with. Well, um, to help the students. Um, Back in 2021, the U.S. Digital Corps established a two-year career fellowship, and it covers four areas, software engineering, um, uh, product management, data analytics, and cybersecurity. This is a wonderful program, uh, and I, I would encourage those students who are ready to graduate. The only caveat is you have to be a U.S. citizen or national. So uh, you're, if you get selected as a fellow in this program, you spend two years being placed in different government agencies, and it's just a wonderful opportunity. We, we had one of our <coughs> Columbia students um, who was in the initial cohort, and she, she just loved the program. At the same time, uh, we were also trying to push some of these ideas uh, across uh, the government and other organizations. 
So um, I was involved in, in uh, these two books. Uh, the first one on pivoting government through digital transformation. This came out in August. Uh, and then the, the developing the intuitive executive, looking at the use of analytics plus intuition equaling success actually came out uh, last month around October 19. So the good news though for the government is that they did realize that they have to do more in this space. So as, as I mentioned previously, they did put together a data scientist classification. Um, and um, uh, in fact, the US uh, Department of State, the State Department was looking to hire about 50 data scientists over this past year. Uh, and you would think State Department, you know, that's unusual, but so anyway, um, so there's quite a bit of interest, um, you know, starting to percolate in this area. Now, one of the other things that the government realized, uh, and this was through the Evidence Act, was that they really needed to have someone at each government agency kind of be in charge of data governance and the data culture. And this individual is called the CDO, the Chief Data Officer. Um, and so, the CDO is really there to spearhead uh, the data governance and lead the organizational development of processes to leverage the power of data. So this is a pretty important job. Well, not so easy. So the most recent study, and there should be another one right around now, but I haven't seen it yet. Uh, there was the federal CDO uh, survey that was done by data, the Data Foundation and Guidehouse, which is a consulting firm in the DC uh, area, although I think they're national. And um, last November, they uh, did this survey, and I'll just point out, it's a little hard to see, I'll point out just one or two main findings in their recommendations. So about, um, about 80%, a little more than 80% of the CDOs felt they did not have adequate resources to fulfill their statutory responsibilities to support their agency missions. And there were a number of key findings, but the recommendations included, you know, first of all, Congress had to increase CDO funding um, and provide more direct resources to the CDOs. Also, OMB is the Office of Management and Budget, um, there is a feeling that Congress should create the federal CDO at OMB at the senior executive level position. So similar, I do some work in knowledge management for NASA, uh, even though there are 10 NASA centers and each NASA center has its own culture, they had their own knowledge management officer, but there still was a chief knowledge officer in NASA headquarters that kind of, you know, served in what they're suggesting as a key role as, as the CDO as it relates, in this case, to data governance. So, you know, much work still has to be done. Now, if you look at what are the job opportunities, um, I took a look at the, the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics, so they published their Occupational Outlook Handbook, um, and this was the most recent results. So, they have it as of 2021, and the median uh, annual wage was about uh, $100,000. Um, and I actually think that's underestimated. But anyway, the key point here is they did expect employment of data scientists to grow uh, almost 40%, you know, over uh, the, the next 10 years from at least 2021 to 2031. So, you know, as we've seen, there's a greater demand, there's a great demand for uh, people with these skill sets and um, and hopefully, you know, you might be interested in, in helping out the government. Well, I'm not going to show you this one because you can't even see it. But the point is, actually, there are many opportunities for um, uh, working uh, with the government uh, in different capacities. So. I actually identified uh, about 30 different data analytics opportunities uh, and grouped them by faculty, student engagement, the talent pipeline, uh, networking and institutional building. So, you know, if you're interested, uh, you know, feel free to at the networking session after the talk or you can shoot me an email and I'm happy to follow up with you. 
Well, another very helpful initiative, um, which was started by New America, is called PIT UN, Public Interest Technology University Network. There are currently 58 members, so these are universities of PIT UN. Seton Hall might think about joining um, uh, the PIT uh, UN network. And um, uh, they actually held their annual meeting. They called it PIT UN convening uh, last month. At, it was at BU at Boston University. Um, and it was wonderful. Um, uh, it really got <laughs> all these members together. It's a little hard to see here, but um, there are actually just two universities outside the US who are members. But, um, you know, many uh, universities and they don't have to be, you know, the most prominent, but any university who has an interest in public interest technology um, can join and, and I'm happy also to point you to the right uh, to the right people there. So the good news too is that you know we we do believe in data and evidence-based reasoning particularly being professors um, and there are a number of symposia research symposia that are being held now that look at uh, applying data and evidence for improving government uh, so this was one that was sponsored by the Data Foundation on sh showcasing progress data and evidence for better government. And you see more and more uh, of these types of symposia, which are so important to show the outcomes uh, of these data science initiatives. Well, even though I'm a big fan of data and evidence-based uh, reasoning and analytics and AI, um, Part of my research, putting on my knowledge management hat, is um, looking at uh, the other side of the brain. So where does experiential learning come into play? So I've been doing research with, with colleagues here in, in abroad, looking at um, how well do executives trust their intuition um, versus analytics. And um, I won't get into my research, but I do want to highlight uh, some of uh, the colleagues at Columbia. This book uh, called Decisions Over Decimals was published uh, this past year. Uh, Odid Netzer uh, is an endowed chair in the, in the business school. Uh, Christopher Frank and Paul uh, are adjunct faculty and they're vice presidents of American Express and Google. And it's a really interesting book. Uh, and they talk about this concept of quantitative intuition and precision questioning. Um, so again, they're looking at the interplay between analytics and experiential learning. Um, I, I just was involved Sunday morning. I had a virtual talk, you know, Thanksgiving holiday at 7.30 in the morning to Germany. And it was a whole day conference on intuition. Um, and there are all different types of intuition. There's expert, there's social, there's moral. There, so we, we won't get into that, but it's a very, um, uh, I think it's a key area, particularly for executive decision-making. Anyway, in this book, they highlight the importance of four, four key roles for data science teams. And the main role that they feel is most important, they call it the data translator. These are the folks that you all are educating here in Stillman. And so these would be um, kind of the uh, interpreters or intermediaries between, let's say, the business units, the end users, and the data scientists, which is a perfect uh, area to, to target. So um, I just want to commend you all on Stillman uh, because I think it is, you know, it's, it's probably the right, uh, the right area to tackle. I was also very interested, you know, in looking at uh, what are some of the opportunities uh, because, you know, many tech firms have been laying off uh, employees right over the past year. And, um, uh, and, and it's been a tough time uh, for, for many. So, uh, so this was a, a sample of about 150 companies. They were looking at Q1 and Q2 hiring plans in the data science area. Uh, and essentially, they found that um, at least uh, about 25% uh, 
of the companies felt that this was still an opportunity. Uh, they were going to hire, you know, people. Um, they had about 50% were holding steady and, you know, the other 20 some percent were holding back a bit. But I really think uh, this is an opportunity even for those uh, industry folks who have the right background, if they were laid off, an opportunity to come back into the government uh, and help out the government. And there are different initiatives that uh, have been created through the Partnership for Public Service to bring back these, you know, very uh, intelligent key, you know, folks in the data analytics area, uh, at least until maybe, in, you know, industry jobs open up uh, where maybe they could command a higher salary again, if that's an issue. Well, we all know also uh, in these days, the impact of AI, which, um, which we see all the time. So um, Gartner has done studies. They claim that by 2025, 95% of decisions that currently use data will be at least partially automated. And, um, and we see this whole impact of, of Gen AI, right? So you saw this past week with Sam Altman, who's the CEO of Open AI. He got fired, then Microsoft hired him, then he got rehired by Open AI. And there's you know tremendous interest looking at this whole area of, of Gen AI. In fact, um, since March 2023, ChatGPT, you know, by Open AI has generated almost 2 billion visitors per month. So um, it's, it's just astounding, you know, what's happening. Uh, but for those students, be very careful. I'm actually working, editing a book now called Regulating Hatred Created by a Generative AI. And there's been a lot of, um, you know, not everything that ChatGPT or BARD, Google's BARD or other, you know, LLM type, uh, uh, Gen AI systems, not everything that they say is correct. And um, in fact, there was a study done um, uh, with BARD and, and 78 out of 100 inquiries, um, uh, there were some really atrocious, uh, incorrect statements that were being made. Um, so be very careful. The good news though with AI is that more and more organizations and governments now are recognizing the importance of AI ethics and AI safety. So President Biden about two weeks ago signed an executive order to look at AI safety. In the US, we have the blueprint for uh, for AI ethics or AI Bill of Rights. Um, uh, NIST uh, also has the AI risk management framework. Europe back in June, uh, through the European Parliament passed the Europe AI Act. So there's just a tremendous amount of interest now looking at responsible AI and responsible data science. And some of the issues that should be considered when you look at guiding the use of these automated systems include human rights, right? So AI should never be used to impinge on fundamental human rights, including dignity and respect, fairness, autonomy, and freedom. Human oversight, you know, explainable use of AI, uh, security, safety, and reliability, personal privacy, and equity and inclusion. So, you know, we see what's going on in the world today, and it's, it's scary. Um, you know, it's this VOCA environment, volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. So, um, but AI, I think, will continue to be an important part of, uh, of what's ahead um, in, our, in our future. Well, I have to plug this one uh, effort that um, when I was at Seton Hall, one of our graduate students, Akil Baskar, um, had worked on uh, with me and He's been working in data analytics in Texas. Uh, he, he's actually, I know uh, Dean Strausser and, and Professor Rosenthal know him. He, he actually um, uh, is considering taking, uh, moving into a doctoral program, PhD program. I pushed him a little bit. 
Uh, he recently got married, so he's <laughs> he's he's working through all those, you know, uh, work uh, family life issues. But anyway, um, there was a nice study where we looked at what are the skill sets needed for business analytics professionals and data scientists, and we identified about 51 uh, key skills, and they they were clustered around business and soft skills, technical skills, and analytic skills. If you're interested. Take a look. This this was published in the Inform Analytics publication. Um, the nice thing is that there's a spreadsheet, embedded spreadsheet, uh, in there that uh, for those who are uncertain about if they want to head more the business analytics route or maybe more the techie, you know, really hard computer science, data science route, uh, it will help you uh, in working through those different skill sets to see where you might be best positioned or maybe you know maybe neither uh, uh, path at all. So um, in the interest of time, I'll, I'll bypass some of this, but I just wanted to point out that um, there were many skill sets that actually we thought that the business analytics professional wouldn't really need to know. They were more technical and analytic skills that um, proved to be important. And, and we actually vetted this through the INFORMS practitioner community, the analytics professionals. Uh, also, we, we used a number of other organizations to, to try to uh, vet some of this. Um, the, the red, um, might be a little hard to see, refers to the business analytics professional skills. The green is data scientists and the purple are both. So I, I won't go through all this, but the point, kind of the aha moment for us is that um, we, we discovered that um, even as a business analytics professional, you have to be pretty savvy in some of the technical uh, skill sets that you would think might be associated more with a data scientist. So I wanna be mindful of the time. I know we're supposed to wrap this up close to eight and I wanna leave time for Q and A and comments. So let me just close with these last few slides. So. I think there are many opportunities to help infuse data analytics into the US government and to further enhance the digital talent pipeline in the government. So certainly digital transformation will continue to be important. Uh, and I actually started a new book series about two years ago, looking at this whole area of digital transformation, accelerating organizational intelligence. And um, in addition, further educating federal executives in applying data and um, in evidence along with their experiential learning uh, will be critical for making informed decisions. So certainly we still have to deepen the analytics culture in the government. We also have to further address the issues raised by these federal chief data officers to be sure that they're resourced appropriately to carry out their missions. And um, but I'm very optimistic. It's certainly exciting times ahead. And for those you know interested, um, uh, here are some of my favorite books. But there are many others that you know you could take a look at. Try to donate a few books to our library here at Seton Hall. So if you have problems sleeping at night, just open them up and you'll be fine. So I'm going to close with this quote. Uh, my wife Jan and I were walking the last week. Um, uh, in New York, and we passed a storefront that had this this sign on this window. You can find inspiration in everything, and if you can't, look again. So um, I thought that was uh, something that would be good to to remember. So I want to thank you all. Go Pirates! And um, I wish you all the best. And I'm happy to to answer any questions or or comments that you have. So thank you. And Renu, um, you're, I'll also give you the slides. Uh, you can access it through the Dropbox um, if, if people want to follow up. Yeah. Anybody have any questions? Go ahead. So, Do you want to use the mic um, just so they could hear you um, uh, for those online? If you could also mention your name in either major or organization, that'd be great. Hello. 
It's a great question. Uh, Janet, do you want to answer it? No. <laughs> okay, so I'm pretty familiar with blockchain, but I'm not a, an expert by any means, although I was mentioning Professor Lowe that um, I did. I was involved with, with a, a book this past year on crypt, cryptocurrency uh, concepts, technology, and applications. There's also a great book uh, that Bill Wagner wrote from Villanova um, on kind of the, the basics of blockchain, so you might want to take a look at, at that as well. So I know there's been quite a bit of interest in, in the government um, looking at black blockchain technologies. Um, I haven't been really tied into that space so much, but I know in Washington, there's the Blockchain Association, um, and it's made up of a number of organizations, both from industry uh, as well as uh, government uh, partners uh, who are looking into advocating the use of blockchain technologies. Um, so uh, from what I know, and maybe I'll, I'll yield to Professor Lowe on this, but uh, uh, I know it's being investigated you know, closely, but I'm not exactly tied into you know, where it's being used the most. Um, not to deflect the, the question, but Professor Lowe, did you want to comment at all? Uh, based on your course on fintech and blockchain, you might have a better idea. I mean, I have some points here. That oh, that'd be great. So, you know, I know for blockchain technology, the government was to use it. You know, they'd be able to leverage their data analytics. You know, they'd be able to input all their data into the blockchain network, and then they'd be able to monitor, analyze, and make decisions based on these, uh, based on the data that's reported on the blockchain. You know, I was also looking at other points where it's enhancing capabilities. So as we mentioned before, there's a small percentage of people in the government that don't really have the knowledge of you know how to utilize this data, how to make decisions on it. So you know with the rapid evolution of technology, I see uh, blockchain as a means for the workforce to not only gain the skills to be able to make smart decisions, but also be able to adapt to new technology and tools and concepts. Mm. Um, it was also, you know, the, the building a parent and efficient digital society. So I know by leveraging analytics, the digital uh, government can contribute significantly to the development of the digital society by you know, securing their uh, their data and information, so protecting against fraud or cyber threats, as well as being transparent, which ensures accountability and trust in the society as we know now. And then also looking at uh, efficiency, you know, it provides them to be able to provide better service for their uh, the society as well as reducing bureaucratic um, inefficiencies. So those are some key points that came up. That's great. No, I appreciate that. Uh, sounds like you, <laughs> you're better equipped than I'm to answer that question. <laughs> Thanks, Will. And there might be questions online. I'm not sure if I could see them, but uh, I don't know if you want to go back and forth, Renu, but I'll, I'll leave it up to you. Let's see. There are a couple of questions from my class. Is Madeline, Dylan, or Marco there here? Okay, um, I, all three of you had similar questions regarding public-private uh, partnerships um, and uh, if there are any international models or collaborative efforts that the U.S. government would draw inspiration from. 
I should have asked him, I'll let you ask the question. <laughs> but you want to expand on that? We couldn't hear you. What did he say? You don't have your. Um, yeah, so I said, uh, would it be possible for the federal government to work close to allies to expand the AA Olympics uh, into the workforce of the domestic and internationally, so like, we see other countries? I can answer that. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, it, yeah, it, it's interesting. If, if we look even just at this whole area of AI, um, you, you see uh, different parts of the world kind of doing different things. So, as I mentioned uh, back in June of this year, uh, the Europe AI Act was really the first legislation passed to address uh, AI safety and ethics issues, uh, looking at transparency, algorithmic bias and fairness, um, you know, and what's ahead uh, with uh, artificial general intelligence, for example. And, and the U.S. also has its own blueprint, although uh, NIST is the National Institute for Standards and Technology, and uh, they created what's called the AI Risk Management Framework, but many countries uh, are using that as a model in which to develop their guidance for AI safety and ethics. Um, uh, and so it's, um, and of course through, you know, the, the G7, there have been a lot of G7 meetings where these types of issues also have been raised. Uh, so, you know, certainly there's awareness across the world as to what the issues are. Um, Europe tends to be a little more formal. Um, uh, and, you know, they were ahead of us, I think, with the GDPR, looking at data protection rights, you know, versus took us a little longer to look at that. So, uh, so you know, there are kind of pros and cons of, of what some of these different nations are doing. Is that is that useful? Yeah, thank you. Any other questions? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Uh, thank you for the presentation. I really do appreciate it because I found it interesting when you talk about data Can can you tell me your name and your major and yeah? Right, thank you. Just, I can't hear you too well, just, yeah. I've attended multiple um, seminars on LinkedIn learning uh, for data science, and now I'm going to talk about data ethics, so I really appreciate bringing that to light. I want to know why you think uh, in the data, why do you think most executives don't trust the data that's being uh, data generated and analyzed? Uh, by the science institute due to the science technology, where did you gain the data from? Um, where do you think that is good? Because I know you mentioned you were doing the study, you mentioned AI, so I don't think you should have done that. If that makes sense. Great, yeah, thank you so much. Um, so, from, from the research that I've seen, um, a lot of the um, uncertainty for the trustworthiness of, of the data uh, in particularly government organizations has been this interoperability issue. There are many, many systems that are out there in uh, uh, different ways that the data has been identified, some spurious data, you know, uh, um, that's why this chief data officer was created, this role to, to kind of get at this uh, data governance and, uh, you know, building kind of this culture of data to make sure that it's as accurate as possible. So I think that's, that's why a number of uh, executives um, from the research studies have felt a little bit uncomfortable um, because, you know, we all know from Geico, the, uh, garbage in, garbage out, right? So if, if the data 
isn't trustworthy, you can't, you know, can you rely on the analytics from that? Um, there is, I heard a, a great speaker, I can't pronounce her last name, but it's Dr. Joy. I just gave the book to you all for the uh, Stillman Library. It just came out called Unmasking AI. And she uh, is an MIT trained uh, 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 PhD and she formed an organization called the Algorithmic Fairness Alliance. Um, <laughs> Um, so this, uh, I heard her talk a few weeks ago as part of her book tour uh, at the Ford Foundation in New York City. It was her first stop. And um, so she has a book out called Unmasking AI. And she really looks at this issue of, of ethics and fairness and transparency and making sure the data sets in which some of these systems were trained, you know, cover uh, all the diverse areas and, and, and diverse, uh, uh, you know, skill sets and, and backgrounds. So she, um, uh, she was stressing that um, even when she was doing her PhD at MIT, she showed that, I won't mention the companies, but some major companies which um, uh, were producing results, you know, which, um, were um, very biased, you know, for a number of reasons. And she even tried to garner the support of some of the professors there. I better be careful this is being recorded, but uh, some of the senior professors appreciated her research. Others were a little fearful because they didn't want to lose their funding, you know, by some of these major companies. So, you know, you have that interplay. But um, but I think this whole, you know, if as a student, if you were looking for a new type of job, if you have the background and skill sets, an AI ethicist is going to continue to be a key role that many organizations are going to hire for. And you're already seeing that. The other key role um, is called the uh, AI prompt engineer. So the whole field of Prompt engineering, in which large language models like ChatGPT and BART are based, um, uh, encompass this field of what's called prompt engineering. And uh, I've recent, recently seen salaries. I'm not smart enough to be AI prompt engineer, but the salaries that they're advertising are about 250,000 to 330,000 starting out. So. You know, there are some interesting niche areas too that you're going to continue to see uh, evolve um, uh, over, over the coming years. So, um, but certainly AI ethics and safety, even with President Biden's executive order, um, you could take a look at that from two weeks ago, and it's going to continue to be very important. Is it Walt? Was it Walt? Oh, Manuel. <laughs> so, my question is going to be about based on ChatGPT. So, I kind of want to get your opinion on ChatGPT. You might want to use the mic so they can hear you online. So, like I said, my question is based on ChatGPT, right? So, I want to get your input on ChatGPT on it. And if you are looking to utilize this AI to help you with your data analytics and, you know, Now, I know you mentioned that ChatGPT doesn't always make correct statements or gives correct answers. Now, is that something that is wrong with the algorithm itself, or is it something that's wrong with the data scientists that are inputting the data into ChatGPT and therefore coming out with these incorrect answers and statements? So I just want to basically get your input on ChatGPT a little further. Yeah. So certainly, you know, the algorithms are, are being worked on, uh, you know, e each day. But, you know, part of the issue is uh, uh, any of these generative AI models, uh, they're, you know, they're trained on, on the data that's out there, right? And so not all that data is reliable. Um, uh, so I'm not against Gen AI models like ChatGPT. It's just you have to be careful you know, of, of what comes out as the output. Now, with that said, um, 
I know a number of real estate agents, they say they, they couldn't live without ChatGPT because it really helps them in putting together the property description, right? And um, uh, for fun, I, I wanted to see whether ChatGPT would replace us. Uh, so I put that in as a query and uh, I had an interesting response and said, look, um, uh, my knowledge base is only as good as 2021, but you know, I still think uh, there are a lot of AI machine learning models uh, that um, you know still have to progress in, in sophistication to equal you know what humans are able to do. Um, so um, I think there's some really neat things. Uh, our, our younger son, you know, even AI enhanced um, images, and I think Frontier Voices. I mean, there's some really cool AI you know companies that uh, uh, that are looking at a number of areas relating to Gen AI. So um, I think it's here to stay. Um, you know, as a professor, uh, some schools, I don't know what the policy is, is Seton Hall, but uh, you know, if you use chat, you know, are you allowed to use chat GPT? And if you are, you know, you have to get proper attribution. Uh, some schools in their honor code, um, you know, won't allow you to use some of these Gen AI models. I think they're here to stay, and uh, but again, you have to be mindful of what's of what the output is because it's not always correct. Yeah, professor. Yeah. Okay. Just a little louder, Ben. Data science and data analytics. Mm. Uh, and you pointed out in your article, um, what, what, is, what is the growth rate of each data science and data analytics? I sometimes hear in the public, they get merged together. And I think the growth rate is different between the different fields because they are very different. Mm. Um, I guess my distinction is that I help create um, data science at Verizon. And um, hiring a data scientist to be over a year to find people. But data analytics are <coughs> So there's a difference between those fields and the knowledge um, that's required for each. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting. There's kind of a blurring uh, because a number of universities have programs in business analytics. Some have data analytics, some have data science, right? And so, I mean, I look at it as kind of business analytics being a little more applied oriented uh, as kind of the intermediary between, let's say, the end user the, and the computer scientist or the data scientist. Although those who have programs in data analytics somewhere in the middle might say, no, we're kind of the intermediary, right? And then I always think of, you know, the data science or data scientists as, you know, really being more the computer science, the real techie, algorithmic, you know, development uh, folks. So, um, so there is a blurring. I know at Tufts University, uh, they have a master's of data analytics. Um, at Columbia, there's in the business school, there's the business analytics programs, but then, you know, there's also the data science programs. Um, and, and so, you know, it really varies, but I think there's a blurring. Um, so, with the work that we had done here at Seton Hall a few years ago, at least we were trying to uh, decipher between the business analytics professional and the data scientists, and what are the different business and soft skills, technical skills and analytics skills that would be important. So um, anyway, um, but it, it's an area for further investigation. Okay. That was fantastic. <laughs> um, Dr. Leibovitz will be uh, hanging around for a while, so uh, if any of you want to um, chat with him, uh, he'll be more than happy to do so. Um, before you all leave, students, if you haven't had your attendance recorded, make sure you do that. We all also have some snacks for you outside uh, to enjoy. Thank you all for coming and have a great night. <laughs>